Hey, everybody, hope you're doing well today. Let's take a look at the Keynesian perspective of macroeconomic equilibrium and try to understand exactly what it means. And this would be juxtaposed to the neoclassical perspective of macroeconomic equilibrium. So if you haven't watched that video, I would suggest that you do that first and then come back to this one. All right, here we go. This video is designed to talk about the Keynesian perspective of macroeconomic equilibrium. And just like the neoclassical view or the neoclassical model, the equilibrium level of output is going to be where aggregate demand is equal to aggregate supply. According to the Keynesian economists, however, this equilibrium level of output may occur at different levels. Significantly, they believe that the economy may be in long-run equilibrium at a level of output below the full employment level of national income. And this will be the case if the economy is operating at a level where there is spare capacity. In this view, the equilibrium level of output depends mainly on the level of aggregate demand. Aggregate demand. Aggregate demand in the economy. So when you're thinking about the Keynesian perspective, I want you to have in your mind very clearly that what is going to change, or rather what is going to determine the equilibrium point, is aggregate demand because there's an absence of a short-run aggregate supply curve in the Keynesian model. Take a look at this very simple Keynesian aggregate supply curve. And this is the one we looked at last chapter. And it's very simple, right? What does it say? Well, it says that during this region of the supply curve, we call it region 1, any change in demand, any change in demand... AD1, AD2, if aggregate demand expands out, there will be no change in the price, average price level of goods and services in the economy. Why is that? Because in Region 1, it's believed that there is something called spare capacity. And spare capacity means that the economy itself has the ability to expand without the producer's having their costs rise. So the factors of production are not going to rise. They are going to stay constant, and therefore the average price levels in the economy will not change. And that is because of the existence of what is known as spare capacity. I'm going to go into this a little bit more detail in a second, but I'm just giving you the overview. Okay. The second region of the Keynesian aggregate supply curve is this region here, right? region 2. Region 2, you can see here, if you were to superimpose an aggregate demand curve on top of this, that if aggregate demand were to be here, there's aggregate demand 1 in this region, and aggregate demand 2, that as a result, not only are you going to get an increase in output, right? This was an increase in output out here, right? To that one here to there. And the price level stayed the same. But in region 2, where spare capacity is being used up, you are going to see not only a change in output, right, from there to there, but also some inflationary pressure or a rise in prices from, say, P to P1, okay? And we'll make this... What's important in this region is to see that as the spare capacity is used up, as the economy is getting closer to its long, to its full potential, full capacity, of course labor is going to be demanding higher and higher prices. And so along this side of the curve, you have to imagine an economy that's way underneath its uh, total potential. And then as a result of that, if you just think about a worker who's out of work, if they can get a job, they're not going to say, hey, 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 I need more money. No, 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 no. They're going to say, hey, okay, you got jobs? Jobs are so scarce. I'll take whatever you give me. But as output increases, that means employment is increasing or unemployment is decreasing, and there's going to be less and less, fewer and fewer unemployed people, and therefore the wages are going to go up. If wages go up in this area of the curve, then the uh, factors of production of all firms are going to go up, and you're going to see a rise in the average price level. Then lastly, on this curve, you will see region 3. And region 3, which is located, of course, right here, if there is a change in aggregate demand, well, this is aggregate demand, we'll call this 4 and 5. If aggregate demand shifts outward, you will see that in this area, well, the government, the government, the economy is already working at full capacity. 
In other words, the economy is experiencing full employment. It's experiencing a situation where the economy is, has full, it's, it's reached its full potential. Its real output is maxed out. And as a result of that, any change from AD4 to AD5 is going to have only inflationary pressure, okay? Just inflationary pressure on goods and services in the economy. So there's sort of the overview. Now I'm going to kind of go back a little bit, and I want to show you this uh, next curve a little bit. Okay. So in aggregate demand, if aggregate demand is a level shown here in this diagram, right, then equilibrium will occur at a real output level of Y with a price level of P. As noted, if aggregate supply can be perfect or aggregate supply can be perfectly elastic because of the existence of spare capacity with high levels of unused factors of production such as unemployed workers and or underutilized capital. It is important to observe in this case that the equilibrium level of output is below the full level of employment. Of course, we're way underneath this full level of employment which is represented by YF. We say then that there is a deflationary gap, a deflationary gap, whereby the level of aggregate demand in the economy is sufficient to buy up the potential output. I'm sorry, whereby the level of aggregate demand in the economy is not sufficient to buy up the potential output that could be produced by the economy at the full level of output. This may also be referred to as an output gap, though not easily measurable. It could be shown as the distance from a point inside the country's hypothetical production possibilities curve to a point outside of it. We're not going to worry ourselves about that. But what I want you to know is the deflationary gap in the Keynesian model is this gap here. Now, why is that? Well, if you could imagine an AD curve here and then having it move in to a point where it's um, used up or it's... it's, it's it's moved into AD here, you can see that as this curve slides inward, as the curve slides inward, what's going to happen? There's going to be a decrease in the price level uh, in the economy. So that is how in the Keynesian model we would show the, de the deflationary gap. If, in the Keynesian view, aggregate demand can increase such that there's an increase in the level of real output without any consequence in the price level, okay? So think about that again. In the Keynesian view, aggregate demand can increase such that there is an increase in the level of output without any consequent increase in the price level, which is what we uh, had just talked about. So on a different graph, okay, we'll look at this graph. You can say what that is saying is that here, the Keynesian perspective, the impact of an increase in aggregate demand when the economy is operating below its full employment level. And so here is 81, here is 82, and we can see, as I described at the beginning, that there's an increase in the output from Y1 to Y2, but because we are so far inside the overall full economic uh, employment level, you, have a, you actually have an increase in aggregate demand, an increase in output without any change in price levels. And so you can see that here, along this line of the part of the curve, spare because of spare capacity in the economy, producers can employ the unused factors of production to increase output with no increase in costs. And therefore, along here, there is no inflationary pressure. Okay. However, if aggregate demand increases from A2 now out to A3, and we are operating, as you can tell, in region two of the curve, right, in here, region two of the curve, then the economy starts to experience inflationary pressure as available factors of production are become more and more scarce and their prices are bid up. And therefore, the price level in the economy would go from P1 to P2, to compensate for the producer's higher costs. However, if the economy is operating in Region 3 at, full and at a full level of employment, as we see here in AD1, and there's an increase in aggregate demand, then the outcome will be purely inflationary. And you know that because there's no increased output. Why? Because the economy is working at its limit, at its limit. 
And that is that there is no increase in output and only a change is, and the only change is in an increase in the price level. Of course, this is because it is impossible for the economy to produce any further increase in output in the long run given the existence of the factors of production. So in the Keynesian model, there is not the, po the possibility that it could move beyond its real output. The way you could ex describe this, of course, as an increase in aggregate demand from, from A1 to A2, re because it results in no change in output as the economy cannot produce output beyond full employment level of output, the only impact is an increase in the price level from P1 to P2. And therefore, we say that there is an inflationary gap, an inflationary gap, whereby the level of aggregate demand cannot be satisfied given the existing resources. And as a result, the price level rises to allocate scarce resources among the competing components of aggregate demand, i.e. consumers, producers, government, and the foreign sector. Now, I've gone back to this original graph, and I just want to talk about the demand-side policies of the Keynesian model. As, as you can see, the diagrams and explanations illustrate that the Keynesian perspective of different possible long-run positions of the economy. And what's important is the conclusion that the long-run equilibrium level of output is not necessarily equal to the full employment level of income, and that the economy can become stuck in equilibrium at a level of output that is below full employment. Let me say that again. What's important is to conclude that the long-run equilibrium level of output is not necessarily equal to the full employment level of income and that the economy can become stuck in an equilibrium at a, at a level of output that is below full employment. Okay, so unlike the neoclassical example where there is always a short-run aggregate supply and a long-run aggregate supply. In the Keynesian model, the economy can keep functioning at a level that is below full output. Keynes didn't say in the long run we'll end up at full potential. That's what the neoclassical model says. What Keynes said, and this is his famous quote, in the, in the long run we're all dead. So in the long run, there is no long run. It's either where you are or where you aren't. And if you are operating here, you can get what's called stuck operating below the full level of employment or below working at full capacity. So maybe there's a shift, sure, maybe there's a shift out here for a time, and then maybe after that happens, you know, there's a big depression and the aggregate demand shifts inward to here, right? But, and then after things get fixed up, everything shifts back out and becomes all, you know, hunky-dory out here at AD 4, Right? But in the long run, it isn't a conclusion. It isn't necessarily going to be that the <clears throat> economy is working at its full and real level of output. And that is a critical piece of information to understand about the Keynesian model. Because this has significant implications for the role of government in the economy. Governments, therefore, seek to intervene. They seek to intervene to steer the economy towards full employment and will use demand-side policy management. Okay, Demand-side or demand management policies. And these involve the fiscal and monetary policies introduced earlier. What are those? Expansionary and contractionary. So, <coughs> excuse me, if for a second I clear this up as much as I, I can, this means government intervention. Because all that, all that really dictates, what dictates the level of output in the economy is what? Aggregate demand. So, therefore, if you want expansionary policies, they're used to increase aggregate demand, to increase the equilibrium level of output. So if it, this is 81 and you draw, lower taxes on corporations or on, con, on consumers, you're going to get an expansion of the ag aggregate demand out here, which would be an increase, of course, <coughs> of real output from Y1 to Y2. If, for some reason, the economy were working out here in this portion, really humming along way beyond um, what is healthy in terms of inflation in the economy, and the government wants to slow it down a little bit, there's 83, 
here's 84, the government can use contractionary policies, constricting in some way either C plus I plus G or net exports, consumption, investment, government spending, or net exports to solve the problem. So in the long run, we're all dead, said Keynes. And what he meant by that was there's no long run. <clears throat> in the long run is not necessarily the... In the long run, the government, the economy is not necessarily going to work out here at full potential. But rather, the government, therefore, needs to get involved in order to expand aggregate demand outwards as much as possible to achieve a full capacity, an economy that's running at full employment levels and at full capacity. Okay, I hope you found this video to be helpful, and we'll talk to you in a bit.